God is so amazing. God is so amazing. Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to recognize that none of this is because of us. It's because of you, Lord. Because you first loved us. And Lord, indeed, you're just reminding us over and over how loved we are. Every one of those testimonies is a testimony of grace, a testimony of love, a testimony of people being accepted who should not have been accepted. And Lord, we just receive that love, <laughs> that ridiculous love, that reckless love, that overwhelming love. We're just recipients of it. Thank you for reminding us of it over and over. And thank you that, Lord, you've given us a home, a family where we can be loved, where we can love, where we can walk together to the thing you've called us to. And so we just invite you now, Lord, with hearts full, just already having heard your word. I already know there's somebody who has heard what they came to hear already. And the someone will just be putting a full stop to the sentence. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would allow us to truly be aligned, giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We love you, Jesus. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Come on, somebody give glory to Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Amen. Ah, today I want to talk about God is a rewarder. And, and like I said, I'm just adding full stop. People have already preached the sermon. We have even seen how God rewards by answering prayers when we surrender. Amen. I'll not forget that one. <laughs> yeah. My brothers and sisters, therefore, my dear, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that the labor in the Lord is not in vain. By the way, when they put it on the screen, just close your eyes, ignore them. They're just trying to help you not memorize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have this thing by heart. It should be just ringing in your heart. Psalm 144 verse 1. Ah, some people know it. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Amen. There's no end. My hands for war, my fingers for battle. This is what God is doing for us, by the way. He's training us. He's training us to stand firm. He's training us not to, not to let anything shake us. He's training us for war. He's training us for war. You know, it's interesting. Somebody had some of the things I've said and said, Pastor M, a loving father would never, would never be so warlike. You know, I think we've, we've, we've kind of domesticated God in our generation. We've made, we've, we've made him sweet baby Jesus. Like God never grows up for some of us. Like we left him in the manger, you know. No, no, God is a man of war. He's a mighty warrior. There's parts of scripture that you need to read. We've been talking about Joshua for heaven's sake. Yeah, he's a God of, he, he's, he's a man of war. He takes down, he's a commander of the armies of heaven. That's who he is. And he trains his sons and daughters for the same. Let nothing move you. We've spoken about how to backslide proof our lives. How to ensure we have resilient faith. And we, yesterday we talked about how to always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And I love the fact that Apmo came and just underpinned it. He underpinned it. Because really what we are saying is none of this thing comes from ourselves. We're not giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we want to earn, because, because we want to earn heaven. Because we want to earn his love. You are more loved than you could ever imagine. Oh my goodness. That, like that was just, for me, that was my moment of the gathering. Like it's, I am more loved than I could even imagine. And I, I always tell people, there's a friend of mine who I met. Actually, there's two guys I've met like that where I was confused. You meet a guy and you come with that thing of, yeah, show me what you got. But the guys don't say it. They just, it's there. Show me what you got. <laughs> show me where I should be impressed. And I remember both of them had, one, one of them was an American, one of them is a Kenyan. Uh, and both of them just had this thing of, I have nothing to prove. I like you. I want to hear from you. I want to know more about you. And I'm like, dude, you're not a chick. Why? Why? Where is your, where is your armor? Where is your... <laughs> and I'd share a story and the guy's like, wow, that must have really hurt. Tell me more. And I'm like, dude, gosh, that's not how we do it, man. When you tell a guy things are hard, he tells you, yeah, yeah, I feel even me, by the way, things are even me are harder. By the <laughs> that's strong, strong. Yeah, we just say strong, strong. 
You don't even want to know the details. It's like you might contaminate me with your weakness, you know. But the guy is like, no, no, tell me more. I want to pray for you. And then what, I, what happened, I was so confused. And then I began to ask, why are these guys so different? And you know what I found out? For both of them, they had fantastic relationship with their fathers. And their fathers, both of them, loved them, told them they loved them, hugged them, were demonstrative in their love. And so these boys were not trying to pretend to be anything they were not. They knew I'm loved. And when you know you're loved, you don't need to compete. Because why am I competing with you? You have your issues. So I'm here to be a blessing. By the way, that, it threw me. I mean, I, have, I, I grew up with a really great father. I grew up in a fantastic home. My dad, really, they, they, he loved us. But growing up, I don't remember hearing the word, I love you. I don't remember, come, let me hug you. It, it's not that he was bad. He just didn't know that, how to do it. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. African men, we don't show emotion. Yeah? But it damaged me emotionally. I didn't know. I was being damaged emotionally by not knowing how to express myself. Not knowing to how to say to a fellow man, Pastor Kev, I love you, man. Yeah. By the way, I feel so good that I can tell my son that. Yeah, because those days it was like, I love... Ish. He might think there's something wrong with me. <laughs> Mercy. Hey, God have mercy on us, men. We need to learn. And then, then because of that, you don't even tell your wife you love her. You know, that's a problem now. It, begin, it just stunts us emotionally. But when you understand you're loved by your father, when you understand as a man that God deeply, deeply, deeply cares for you, that you're actually his son and he's proud of you, and there's nothing you'll ever do to earn it, you can't. Let me tell you, you're going to be so relaxed. You'll be so relaxed. You're actually going to find even your business will succeed because of that. Man, we carry so much weight. Sometimes you lose a job, you get, you get mental issues. Because your identity is wrapped up on proving yourself. When you no longer have to prove yourself, you relax. One, and this is not my sermon, by the way, but <laughs> can I just flow? There's, there's a time, my, my, my wife, we, we, I, I tell this story how we had a business that we were running. And it was a video production business, very successful business. And I remember we had an argument at one point and she fired me. Uh, <laughs> it was actually my business that I founded. But then the way we normally work is I'm very good at founding things, but I'm not good at running things. So she's very good at running things. So she came and ran the business. And then I would come and I'd find things and I'm like, why are you guys doing things like this? Who said that's not how it's supposed to be done? And then she'd come and she's like, you're messing my team. You're messing my office. So one day she told me, either you leave or I leave. And she said, I will allow you to be on the board, but that's about it. I don't want you in my office. I don't want you talking to my staff when I'm not there. That's the condition of me staying. Otherwise, I'm going to look for a job. And I knew if she looks for a job, the thing dies. So I said, fine, I'm fired then. So I left and, and I would now have to keep my mouth shut even when I saw things going wrong. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, it was just like, I can only wait for the end of the month for the board meeting then I could try and insert an agenda. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, where this story is going is one day I walk into the company and I see our chief competitor. I mean, this guy is like neck to neck. I mean, he's a chief competitor. And he's inside our studio. Now, when I ran, the, when I ran things... The studio was like private. You know, you write private, staff only. So it's like you don't want the competition to see what you're doing. So I walk in and there is the guy and he's even in, working on one of our machines. A competitor. I, I couldn't stop. I could not even, I could not not talk about that. I was like, ha, ah, no, 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 no. There, we have crossed the line. How does our competitor come in to see how we're running the business? These are secrets. And I went and told her, what are you doing? And she said, like, like, how do you let him be in our space? She said, I just called Robert. I told him we're having issues with our computer. He said, I can help you fix it. And he's helping fix my computer for free. I said, huh? <laughs> and sure enough, Robert fixed the computer. It was as good as new. It was something that I'd never have known how to fix. He sorted it out and even started helping, collaborating, and giving her business. I said, ah, oh. That's how you're supposed to do things. Because you see, guys, you never do that. We don't learn because we compete. But women, because they don't have those hang-ups, they collaborate. And because of that collaboration, they move forward. Are you understanding what feeling? Because they're not trying to prove themselves. 
And I began to realize I had major issues as a guy and they were holding me back. And so now I try not to compete with my fellow men. I'm like, guys, I love you, man. I love you deeply. Yeah. And not just to tell guys, strong, strong. Say, no, no, come, let's talk. What is that issue you're going through? Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Yeah. Let's, let's get deep with each other, man. Yeah. Guys are not even responding. You see, they're just like, strong, strong. My sons. <laughs> wow. Anyway, I know they are feeling me. You know, men sometimes say, I love you in my heart. <laughs> if it was the ladies by now, they'd be like, yes, yes. <laughs> Guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We feel you, Pussy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have, we need salvation. Don't we? Men, we need salvation. Amen. <laughs> we do. But God is saving us. He's changing us. The men of Mavuno are different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're different. They're not like the men of the world. God is changing us. We don't have to try and front we can be tender warriors. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can. We can. We don't have to try and pretend we are not what we are. Yeah. My strength doesn't come from you. My light doesn't shine because yours goes off. No, I can help you. I can raise you and shine as well. Yeah. We are That's what a real father does, isn't it? A father wants his children to be greater than himself. That's what a father wants. And he's proud of them when they succeed. God is a rewarder. I just had a man say, we love you, Pastor. And which man was that? Ish. Hey, I feel you, man. I love you, man. Love you so much. God is a rewarder. Luke 19, 11 to 27. Luke 19, 11 to 27. It's an interesting story. It's one we've read many times. And I've probably preached about it several times. But I just felt as I prayed about the rewards God has for us. God took me in a surprising direction. One that I wasn't expecting. And he took me to this parable. Luke 19, 11 to 27. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and he returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had been given, whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master said, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take what you did not put in and you reap what you do not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Ah, when, why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they replied, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them over here and kill them in front of me. Wow. Wow. This passage was given to people who expected that the kingdom was appearing at once. They'd seen Jesus. They understood he was the Messiah. So they figured, okay, it means that God is about to show up in his, with the angel armies and take over, destroy the enemies, and set up his kingdom. That's what the Jewish expectation had been. So Jesus decided to manage their expectations, but also give them an insight into how things would work in the future. He told a story about a man who decided to invest through his workers with a clear expectation that over time he would receive a return. He would receive profit from the money he invested in each of them. He gave 10 servants each one mina. One, uh, one, it's equivalent amount for each servant. And he wanted the people to invest it for him. He said, put this money to work until I come back. In the New King James Version it says, do business until I return. Invest, do kingdom business until I return. Seven of the servants had no report when he 
came back. Which to me implies that they, had really, they didn't even do any business. They, in fact, they, they ate the capital. Do you know guys like those? They get money and they eat the capital. They take all the capital and they use it to buy a new car. First business they get, all the profits, they buy a car. They upgrade their lifestyle. And there's nothing to show by the end of all the investors' money that they have. Of the remaining three, one multiplied it ten times, the other five times, and the last one kept it safe as it had been given to him. And this passage, it's actually one of the ones that tells us, it's one of the many passages in the Bible that tells us that God will reward us in eternity for our conduct here on earth. So before I talk about hidden treasures here on earth, I need to actually be honest with you and tell you the most important hidden treasures are not here on earth. They're actually in eternity. Uh, God has some treasures that we often as Christians don't think about. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, Jesus taught and he said, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Each person will receive a reward. The Son of Man will come back and he will give everybody a reward according to what, what they have done. Jesus was saying several important things about himself and about human beings. He was saying, number one, that he would come back again. So you need to understand this. Jesus will return. Number two, when he comes, he will bring rewards. That's the second thing you need to understand. And then the third thing you need to understand is that these rewards will not just be given to everybody in equal measure. That he will give them to each person according to what each person has done. Now, since Jesus hasn't yet returned, we can conclude that even his disciples, because he says when the Son of Man returns with his angels, that hasn't happened yet. So we can presume that even his disciples who followed him are still waiting for that reward to be given. Right? Because it says when. It doesn't say that the minute you die, this reward. It says when the Son of Man returns, these rewards will be given. In order to understand eternal rewards, the first thing I want to teach you today is the six main events of your forever life. The six main events of your forever life. I, I learned the word forever home. Young couples nowadays use that word. We're, we're building our forever home. Have you had people say that with a lot of nostalgia? It's like this is a home we've always lived for. We're building our forever home. By the way, don't build your forever home when you're young. If you're in your 20s and you're building your forever home, you're, you're deluding yourself. Uh, you're too young to build a forever home. You should be investing at this point. You, you, if you're building a home, build a small house. You, you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people, people are young and they build very big houses and then you spend the rest of your money. All, all, your, all, your, all, your, all your investment goes into just that one home. That becomes the only thing you'll ever retire with. Uh, so I tell people, start, start, your start home should be a small home. Start with a small home. Uh, then God will help you move to another home. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to move to my fifth house. Yeah. But it's because a friend told me, start small. So we built a small house that we could move into, and then we grew. I'm talking to people in their 20s and 30s here. Yeah, start, start small. Don't, don't, build, don't, don't build that first house as if you're going to live in it forever. Plan for it to be a rental. It's going to bring you income. It's not in the passage, but that's just my advice. <laughs> Six main events of your forever life. Now we're talking about your forever life. Let's leave your forever home behind. A close look at Jesus' teaching reveals that our life has a clear and knowable timeline of events. Your life actually has a timeline of events that will happen for every single one of us. And by the way, this doesn't just happen to you because you're a Christian. This happens to every human being that was ever created, regardless of creed, religion, geographical area. Every human being will have a clear timeline of events. Uh, you can think of it like a highway with some major exit points. You know, just think of a big highway and it's got like six major places, intersections. And those intersections will happen to every single one of us who travels along life's highway. The six main events, are you ready for them? The first one is what? Birth. Some people say birth. The first one is life. Life. It's interesting, even I would have said birth. But actually, your first main event is not birth. Birth is just the entrance to your first event. Your first event is life. You're created in the image of God, 
and put on earth for a purpose. You did not exist in the forever past. You didn't. At birth, at, well, at conception, <laughs> because I, I believe your life began at conception, and at that point, your life began. You actually uh, will have a forever future, but you don't have a forever past. So your, your life started when you were conceived. Between birth and death, you've got, you've, you're here in this segment called life. Life on earth. And every one of us has that. For some people, it's very short. Some people, it barely happened. Other people, it's very long. Goes into the hundred plus years. But you know what? I'm going to show you that that doesn't really matter at this point. But just understand, the first event in your forever life is this thing we call life. John 3, 6 says, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So what is that saying? It's saying you're a complex being. Even though you are born on earth, you're not just flesh. Because the Lord God took something physical, and then he breathed into it something divine. So there's something of you that is not just a body. There's a spirit. There's a sentient spirit within you. And that spirit is made in God's image as well. There's something about you that is, is eternal. And I love what Anita Ray told us. You know, we, 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 we don't celebrate salvation because we don't understand it. We don't actually understand what's happening. Because there's an eternal spark that comes on. There's a light that was off that comes on. There's something that changes completely that person's destiny and the destiny of many, many other people. If we could understand what happens with just one salvation, let me tell you, we'd be stopping church just to have a party. Because that's what the angels do. They understand eternity. And they understand just how powerful when one person gives their life to Jesus. So this, you're made of flesh, but then there's also spirit. The spirit of God has given birth to something in you that is spirit. And the same way that you're built of flesh, guess what happened in the Garden of Eden? Man's spirit died. Jesus comes back, dies on the cross, that we may have life. Now, it's not that you are physically dead when you receive Jesus. Your body was alive, but your spirit was dead. Jesus' resurrection brings spirit, the spirit, your spirit back to life. Spirit gives birth to spirit. But it's not just that. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. So Paul even introduces a new element there. He talks about the soul. You're not just a spirit. You're not just a body, but you also have a soul. And your soul is that part of you that is the, the thing that drives you. And, and Paul is saying, you're more than just a physical being. There's a self-awareness that you have. There's a soul in you. The thing that makes you a multidimensional being. And then we've talked about the fact that we also have minds. Because remember, Jesus says we love God with all our, 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 our heart, mind, soul, and strength. You're a multi, tell your neighbor, you're a multidimensional being. Yeah. The, the thing about us is our eyes are flesh, so they only see flesh. But when God gives you a spirit of discernment, you start to see much more than just flesh. There are people who actually, I know people who actually see and they can see somebody walking in and they can see demons around them. And sometimes you might think they're crazy, but it's just that God has given them an eye into the spiritual realm. And they can see much more than is happening. Right now, if, you could, if the Lord could open your eyes, you'd freak out. I think sometimes he closes our eyes so that we don't panic. We don't walk around with our minds blown. Because we'd lose focus on our purpose. If you could see the angel armies that are waging war right now over you. If you could see the guardian angels that drove some of you into this place. You know, by the way, some of you, the 11 of you who came and gave your lives, if you could tell what was going on in the spirit, I suspect there were some angels that were just pushing those demons that guard your life. And they were poking them. And they were being forced to come into church. And you're, being, you're, you're here, you don't even know what you're doing in a gathering and you're not even a believer. You're just in church. And you don't even understand in the spiritual realm there's a huge battle going on because God has determined today is the day of your salvation. And the, the, this thing has been planned since eternity and the angels are driving and those demons are clinging on and they're saying, no, he's ours. By the way, if you could see this stuff, you just go mad. But it's happening all around us. There are angels all around us. And there are demonic powers as well that are, are, are claiming their space. 
their legal space. And sometimes what's happening is God wants to release you, but the devil is holding on to a part of you because he says, I have a legal right to be here. And God is the one who made the law. So he's saying, I'm standing on, because the devil actually knows God's law. And sometimes those bondages are there because the devil is saying, I was given legal right to be here. So all this is going on at the same time because you're living in this contested space that is earth. And you have a soul, you have a spirit, you have a body, you have a mind. The second stage, the second main event of your life is death. Is death. When you die, you die physically, but not spiritually. Your spirit doesn't die. Your spirit is eternal, remember. So when you see somebody who's dead, you're, you're seeing the remains. You're seeing the body. But their spirit has left. Their spirit has gone. In, in October last year, I had the, the privilege of seeing my father in his last minutes and seeing his dead body. I saw a body. But I knew. And my spirit testified, my dad is not here anymore. The body is there, but my dad's gone. <laughs> He's away. The spirit part of him has gone because that part is eternal and he's somewhere else. Just as bath is your brief entrance into the life on earth, the death of your body is your instant exit. You exit this planet. You exit earth. Your body may be dead, but your awareness as soul and spirit continues on. Let's look at some scriptures just in case you think I'm, I'm making this up. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 15 It says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. You came naked. You left naked. Your spirit doesn't wear jeans. <laughs> In the spirit realm, there are no clothes. You just leave. Just the way you came. You remember clothes were fig leaves that were sown because people sinned. Spirits don't wear clothes. The pictures you see of angels, anyway. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 8 verse 8 he says as no one has power over the wind to contain it so no one has power over the time of their death it's interesting that you may be the most powerful person on earth but you have zero power what happens to you and when it happens you go you know you go the only two people in all of scripture who didn't experience death were who apart from Jesus Enoch and Elijah yeah, everybody else, including Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, he died again. <laughs> it's only two people. Chances are, unless Jesus comes back in your lifetime, the chances of you dying are like 100%. It's not 99.99. <laughs> it's like all of us will die. This will come. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and after that to face judgment. So, so you, we will all die and it will happen. You know, it's very interesting because people on earth... Even people who don't know God have a major denial of death. Death, when you don't know God, is a very tragic thing. It's very tragic. And they will fight it as much as they can and try and control what happens. And we find people, I mean, I, I remember living in, I lived in California, which is really like the, pit, the place where people worship youth and bodies and you just have to live there to understand. I mean, it's not even like other parts of the world. It's not like other parts of the U.S. It's like there, there's something they used to call the, the summer body. Your summer board. And it's like you can live in another part of the U.S., you'll never feel that pressure. You go to California, and when it's summer, you start feeling, you start looking at yourself in the mirror, and you're tucking yourself in. Because it's just that place where they worship youth. They worship bodies. And people, millionaires, spend billions to look young, to be forever young. But you know what? They all go. The most powerful, the richest of them, they go the same way, naked. The pyramids are just great monuments of human folly, of people trying to control their life after death. Because we have no control of what happens to us after we live. You know, they would actually bury entire armies <laughs> with kings in the past. They just discovered the, 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 the tomb, in, in, I think it was 1974, they discovered the tomb of China's first emperor. And I mean, this thing is six kilometers by six kilometers. It's an entire city. It's got soldiers inside. It's got gold. It's got all the things that they thought would help him in the afterlife to still become important and rich. Now, the poor guy has been rich all his life. He's like, I can't go to the afterlife poor. <laughs> six kilometers by six kilometers, a hidden city that they discovered. By the way, they've never even been able to enter into most of it. 
uh, they are still excavating since 1974. Uh, this is just some of the craziness. The, to the, the tombs of the pharaohs, they are still, they are, some of them were the most important. Everybody on earth knew their name. Today, nobody even knows where those tombs are. They are tombs that are hidden and nobody even knows where they are. They keep discovering new ones of the most important people in the world. Death just equalizes us. It does. The only, thing, the only difference with, between a rich man and a poor man is the size of the coffin. Yeah. Your money, you'll not take it with you. I mean, that's one of, it's one of the most sobering things. You'll not take it with you when you go. And that's what happens at death. We all die. And the question is, what do you do next after you die? And that's the next part then after death, which is number three, destination. So there's life, death, and then destination. You reach your destination after death. And your destination is determined by what you believed on earth. Very interesting scripture. I, I, I'll read a few scriptures about that. By the way, there's neither reincarnation or soul sleep in the Bible. Those are not things that are taught in the Bible and they don't exist. Ghosts don't exist. Zombies don't exist. Somebody say amen. They actually don't. This is just, this, those are, I call those spirits of fear. All of you who are addicted to horror movies, you're friends with the spirit of fear. And vampires. Yeah, that's nonsense. That is, those are all creations of the devil to enslave you with the spirit of fear. Because the devil knows that fear is one of the control. But I used to, I'm talking because I used to be one, I was addicted to horror movies and horror novels. Um, until I got saved and the Holy Spirit testified. When I was a very young Christian, I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. And something told me, stop. Stop. This is actually not of God. Uh, this is actually introducing a spirit of fear into your life. Uh, those are not things. Ghosts don't exist. By the way, when you hear somebody say, oh, my father died and I saw him, that's not your father. That's a familial spirit. You need to understand that. Let me tell you why that's... There's a scripture in the, the Bible. When, when Saul went to the witch of Enda, some of you know that scripture. And the witch was conjuring up the spirit of Samuel. And then God actually brought the real Samuel. And the witch was in shock. Oh my God, oh my God. Because the, the, the witch was not expecting a real... He was ex, she was expecting the familial spirit that she was conjuring up. She was in league with the devil. But God said, I'm going to short circuit that plan by bringing the real Samuel into the room. I mean, that's a, by that should be made a movie. You should read that story if you've never read it. The witch themselves were so scared because they didn't expect... Samuel to come. People don't come back that way. Any, anytime you ever, and when I've, people have come and said, oh, my dad comes to me and he talks to me, I tell them, you, next time you need to bind that spirit. Yeah, that's not your father. Familial spirit means it's familiar with your life. It knows your longings and your desires and it wants to channel you away from God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't, people who go for seances and, and getting witches to tell them things, that is just nonsense. You have one destination. Let me tell you this. The Bible says that life after death, your soul is either with God in heaven or in hell. Far away from God. Some people say, how could a loving God create hell? Hell is a consequence. It is a consequence. Remember I said God is so loving and he's such a good God that he's loving and he's also just. And a judge who treats murderers by, by saying, oh, you murdered someone. Oh, I'm so sorry. In your said, I love you so much. You just go free. That's not a good judge. That is actually a corrupt judge. God is not a corrupt judge. And hell is a consequence of justice. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Jesus spoke to the thief. This man was a murderer, actually. But he made a decision to follow Jesus on the cross. And Jesus said to him, Today, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, that's your eternal destination. Just based on the confession you've made, you're going to be with me in paradise. And Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Jesus talking about the sheep and the goats. He talks about the people who rebel against God. He says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So, so your destination is determined by your beliefs. Did you believe in Jesus? Because Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus is not... <laughs> the mistake people think make is that they believe Jesus is a Christian or that Jesus came for Christians. Jesus is not the Christian God. Jesus is the God of the world. 
whatever you are, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Hindu, whether you're whatever, Jesus did not come to bring a religion. Jesus came to make a way to the Father. That God you're looking for, that God-shaped vacuum in every human being, the only answer to it is Jesus. 1 John 5. What does it say? The one eleven, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. It's as simple as that. And I need you to understand that there are people who are Muslim who are followers of Isa. They're followers of Jesus. They go to their mosques and they worship Jesus. And the Bible, Jesus said, I have sheep that are not of this pen. Some of us will go to heaven and you'll find people wearing kanzu and you'll be shocked. This guy snobbed him. I didn't know. I thought he was, you didn't realize he was a follower of Jesus. What distinguished is not whether you wore a cross on your thingy and you, <laughs> and you said, our father who art in heaven. That's not what distinguishes you as a follower of Jesus. Am I, am I making someone uncomfortable now? I actually know one of my, there's somebody I know who's actually a, 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 a missionary who goes and shares the gospel in very closed and persecuted communities where change, ta, becoming a Christian means instant death. And what he does is when people start to follow Jesus, he actually begins, they start with their home groups, they, they, he targets leaders and the leaders of those uh, communities. And then once the leaders are believers with their families, then they start worshipping Jesus in their mosque on Fridays. They don't change. They don't start wearing jeans and calling themselves Mike or Peter. <laughs> they don't change their culture because Jesus is not bound by a culture. Jesus is the God of the whole earth. And your eternal destination is determined whether you believed in Jesus or you did not. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Am I helping somebody right now? So your destination is based on where, what you believed. The fourth stage, the fourth stage of your life is resurrection. Resurrection. The Bible tells us that every person who ever lived will experience bodily resurrection. All of us will resurrect. We're going to have new bodies. And our new bodies are going to be eternal. If you think your January body is looking good, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you're going to have an amazing body an amazing new body and because God is he's, he's amazing he made us to have bodies so as much as we will leave our earthly body he will give us new bodies and the scripture says that uh, Philippians chapter 3 where does it say that Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 to 21 it says but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Your body will be like Jesus. And not Jesus when he walked on earth, Jesus after he resurrected. Do you remember when Jesus, when they resurrected, then they fell to their feet because they were in shock. They had never seen him like that, shining like the sun. And he says, that's the kind of body you're going to have. Your body is going to be like Jesus' resurrected body. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine yourself? Do you think you'll have a six-pack in your <laughs> resurrected body? <laughs> I don't know whether those things will matter anymore, by the way. <laughs> and then John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, it says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. So in other words, resurrection is not good news for everybody. But it will happen for everybody. The fifth main event, the fifth main event of your life is repayment. Repayment. And that's where eternal rewards come in. So we're, we've been heading towards this part all this time. This is the reward part. This is where every human being will receive their reward or their consequences based on what they did on earth. So believers and non-believers will be judged by Jesus Christ at what the Bible calls the judgment seat, the Bema, B-E-M-A, not BMW. Uh, and it's a judgment seat. It's a place, there's a great white throne. The scripture describes it in many places or the judgment seat of God. And the outcome will determine your degree of reward in heaven or your retribution in hell. Because there are degrees of reward and there are degrees of retribution. Second Corinthians 5.10 
says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That, that's what the one I'm calling the beamer, the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So in every Roman town, they would have a seat where the magistrate would sit and cases would be presented and the, the, the judge would determine what the consequences of crimes or rewards would be uh, to people who had sued. And that's, Paul uses that same metaphor. He says, even God has a judgment seat. And he says, each of us will receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And then Revelation chapter 20 verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The same word there, the throne, the, beam, the, the, the judgment seat of Christ. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is a book of life. And the dead were judged. Remember, these are people, it's saying the dead. <laughs> which means that these ones already passed through, dead, through death to get here. But they're being judged, which means they must be alive, right? So the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So there's a book. And the book has everything you've ever done. And it's, it's, it's this incredible book. I don't know, you know, when the people are writing the Bible, God would use the language they knew. So probably John saw a book with pages. But we have no idea whether the technology of heaven is much more advanced than that. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a cloud. <laughs> and there's, info, there's data in the cloud. <laughs> All right, you, some of you will get it next year. You know. So, so, but there's going to be information. There's going to be technology for you to achieve and to uh, your archived life. All the things you ever did, all the, there's going to be, I don't know how many, just think, is it pentabytes of information? By the time it's recording everything you've ever done, it's there. It's recorded. And it says they were judged because of it. And then number six is eternity. Eternity. So you will live forever in the presence of God. That's eternity. Forever. Or in the absence of of God as a consequence of your beliefs and actions on earth. Jesus taught that an eternal existence awaits everyone. So it's not just people who believed in Jesus who have eternal life. Everybody has eternity. It's just that for some people it will be eternal death because they will still be alive. There's an ex eternal existence there for him. Those who have rejected Jesus and who have chosen him those who have rejected Jesus and those who have chosen him will spend eternity in two different places. Very different existence. But the eternity that Jesus reveals is not just an existence or a state of mind, but it's a real place. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Are you hearing that? Punished with everlasting destruction. There's everlasting life, but there's also everlasting destruction. In other words, it's ongoing. It continues on into eternity. And then Matthew 25, verse 46, then they will go on to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So both of those are eternal, but they're two different things. There's two different eternities. Now let me summarize this. Huh? The two things you can see from this summary of your forever life. I've just described to you what your life is going to look like. I've just given you a snapshot to your future. The first one that you need to understand is most of our life happens after we die. <laughs> most of our life happens after we die. I had a little illustration. I'm do, is, is Pastor B over here with my, with my gadgets, my things? Oh, there you go. So, I'm going to get a volunteer. Can I get somebody in my church? Oh, fantastic. My elders. <laughs> Pastor Mishu, just go and stand up. The elders bench. And then the deacons. Can I have a deacon? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> All right, one is enough. One is enough. Actually, no, no, two of you. Two of you. Let, since you both volunteered. I want you to get this rope. I want you to discover one end. All right? Now, the other deacon hold the other end. All right. I want you... Then to just go with that end until you create a, a nice straight line. Huh? And it's on the screen, so anybody should be able to see this. So just go, 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 go. Lift it over the people's heads so you're not touching anybody's head. All right. 
Now, I'd like you, Pastor Mishu, to hold the ball in that corner. Deacon number, elder number one. And then Deacon, just stand up next to him. Just stand up over here next to the pastor. Move that side. I want you to be on this side of him. All right. And I want you to hold the ball up like this. And then I want you to hold it like this. And then Ben, just pull. All right. George, could you help him? Just hold it up like this so it's not too tiring. Okay. All right. So I want you to notice this is your life. This is your life. This is all the existence that you have. Some of you feel you're very, very old. Too old to jump for Jesus. Too old to do things for God. But I'm telling you, you're very young. You're an infant in your existence, in your eternal existence. Because your life has just begun. This little ball from your birth here until the day you die. Even if you die at 120. You can see why I said it's irrelevant how old you'll be. Because somebody died at 80, another one died at 120. Another one died at 40. Another one died at 10. Can you see how insignificant that gap is? Compared to the rest of your life. Life is just beginning for you. The Bible says that this is eternity. That eternity just goes on and on and on and on. And it's so incomparable to the little thing, the little dot that you have. But here's the most amazing thing. Here's the most amazing thing. The decisions you will make here will determine everything else that happens the rest of your eternity. Is that a bit of a powerful thing? That you have power. God has given you power. That the decisions you make in this little ball will determine the rest of your eternity. Now, I want you to also notice something very interesting. If you are in the place where you're here and you make a decision to follow Jesus, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Hindu, it doesn't matter. You're a follower of Jesus. That decision will determine your eternal destination. But I also want you to notice something else. Your decision will determine your destination. But your actions will determine your compensation. Can I say it again? Your, somebody say it for me. Somebody who heard me well. Your decision will determine your destination. But your actions will determine your compensation. Because every single person who receives Jesus, you're going to heaven. By the way, the minute you decided to, re to receive Jesus, those people who made a decision yesterday to receive Jesus, their destination is the same. Even if you've been a believer, in fact, one of our sisters talked about those people who were born saved. Because their parents were saved and they were even almost conceived in... <laughs> okay, you can't be conceived in church. But they were almost... The, like from the maternity ward, the mom just brought them to hospital to church to be blessed. They were anointed with oil by the priest. They became little children in the church. They're the ones who are carrying the Bible for the pastor. They grew up in, like, that one is going to heaven. But they're not going to heaven more than the person who got saved yesterday. Like the minute you receive Christ, ah, uh ah, -uh, you have an eternal destination. You have an eternal. Can somebody just, God is so amazing. Remember the parable of the workers in the vineyard? Some people came in last minute. They worked the la Any last minute people in the house who are thankful to God. You know what? Some of you are saved long ago, but all of us are going to the same place. Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Our destination is the same. We're all going to heaven. But what we're talking about when we talk about hidden treasures is that there's also something called compensation. I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. Can we just appreciate our deacons and elders? <laughs> wow. has, just, has that opened up somebody's eyes just now? Have I helped somebody? This thing about, it's such a powerful thing because we don't hear much about it. But it is so true. In fact, the thing I find that is interesting 
is that hmm, you must never confuse when we talk about rewards. Because some people start become entering into legalism and start thinking we're talking about approval by God. We're talking about some people are more loved than God. By the way, Elijah was not more loved than you. John the Baptist was not more loved than you. John the disciple who Jesus loved was not more loved than you. Ah, God, you are the disciple that Jesus loves. Yeah, never get that twisted. Even when we see other people getting some rewards you're not getting, it has nothing to do with God's love for you. The father loves his children equally. He loves them. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says, there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we may be saved. You need to understand, the same name saves us. We're all saved, and there's no other salvation. And then 1 John 5, 11 to 12, it says, this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. Whoever has a son has life. It's saying that anybody who has a son of God has life. So the destination is assured. And what we are talking about today, I don't want us, anybody to get it twisted. We're not talking about destination. We're talking about compensation. We're talking about eternal rewards. Our eternal destination is a consequence of what we believe. But our eternal compensation is a consequence of how we behave. Two different things. Now you're going to find that most Christians will fall on two sides on this issue. Some Christians, they really like to emphasize the consequence of what we believe. Uh, because they really feel uncomfortable with any conversation of behavior. Being, having any eternal uh, uh, consequence. And so they talk about the importance of, 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 of being saved by, by uh, being, being righteous and being saved by Christ. Uh, and, and the fact that, look, it's, it's, it's only by faith that we are saved and by grace. And they emphasize that greatly. And then there are other camps that really focus a lot on the eternal compensation part. And they talk about the fact that God, I mean, we must be involved in good works and good behavior. What kind of faith is that that doesn't have any good works? And you find that they are focused on what you do for God. And that's so important. But the thing is that the two camps miss the fact that we're not talking about the same thing here. They're not the same. Both are important. In fact, I suspect destination is more important. In fact, not I suspect, it is more important. Because your destination is the most important thing. You have to have faith in Christ. Your good works cannot save you. It doesn't matter how good your works are. Without Christ, they are nothing. So the first thing, it's important that you have eternal life. But once you have eternal life, this other camp has a point. Because James asked, what good is faith if it has no works? And so both are important and they're both in the same Bible. Our eternal destination, the consequences of what we believe on earth. Our eternal compensation, the consequence of how we behave on earth. And with that understanding, I want us to go back now to the parable. I just want to give you a bit of a, that was sort of like, you know how the movie starts and then it goes like 20 years back. <laughs> so now let's come back to the parable. With that understanding, now you have understanding, all right? So let's come back to the parable. Because there are three servants who are discussed. And I want you to see how the master talks to them differently. The first one is the 10 mina servant. I call him the 10 mina servant. This first servant had multiplied the initial amount he was given until it was 10x. 10x of what he was given. 10 times what he was given. This is actually a return, not of 100%, but of 1,000%. I don't know if you know that. It's not a 100% return. That's a 1,000% return. And the master's response was overwhelming. I mean, the master was like, well done, good servant. My good servant. And he says, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Uh -uh. You've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of 10 cities. You know, as Christians, we think once we are saved, how we use our talent, our time, our treasure is not as important. But we are wrong. The Bible tells us, and this passage shows us, that God is keen that we use all the, re the, the, the resources he's entrusted us in with for the sake of advancing his purpose. And this man is actually, the, the, the master is overwhelming in his praise. He says, well done. He says, my good and faithful servant. And then he gives him 10 cities. The five mina servant is the second one. And he's multiplied 5x, 500%, five times what he was given. I want you to notice what the master did not say to him. Because we don't, often don't talk about that. Do you notice there's no well done? What a shock. 
Did you not notice there was not my good servant? Have you noticed that? Because often we look at it and we think they were told the same thing. They're actually not told the same thing. He says, he, he doesn't even say, well, he, he says, his master answered, you take charge of five cities. The implication is there that he got his reward, but the master noted the lesser level of, commendation, uh, of, of commitment and gave a lesser commendation. It was a lesser commendation. It was not the same commendation because God is not unfair. You know those schools where they go and everybody gets the reward? We all run and then at the end we all stand on the same line and they just give a medal to everybody. It's like we all part- it's like a medal for participation. But that is I always feel like that is such a horrible system because it destroys initiative. Every child is a genius at something. So commend the ones who are genius academically. Yeah, some of you are genius academically. Praise God for you. We're not even jealous. <laughs> and you know why we're not? Because everybody's a genius at something. Yeah, if you, if you understand how humans were made, every child is a genius at something. Don't beat your child to become number one in class. L- let them exert themselves. Teach them to exert themselves and do the best they can. But also help them discover their genius. Because your child's genius might be in sports. Yeah. <laughs> the genius of surrender. That one is for everyone, Pastor Kev. <laughs> your child's genius might be in talking. Yeah? The, some of you used to be the noisemakers in class. You're always being written down by the prefect. Yeah. But today, people like Eric Omondi, Churchill, these famous comedians, those are the, lo- the noisemakers of their time. They're making millions more than the people who are not being written names. That's their genius. And they discovered it. God thank God. I don't know if, if, if their parents had anything to do with it. Many times they discovered it despite their parents. Yeah, some people are good in sports. And some people score, I mean, for every, I mean, somebody like, some of these f- football players, I mean, they make money you'll only dream about. Yeah. And yet in school, they were probably last in class. That's their genius. Some of you are introspective. Like, do you know those people who are just like, they have a rich inner life. <laughs> like, like right now, even as I'm talking, they're already analyzing. Like, Aish. like they go home and they have to sit down and think. I'm so fascinated by males, by the way. I'm like, because I'm not one. You know, I'm like, wow. Like I said, I have children who are males and, you, and, and a wife who's one. And you just look at them and they're like, they have to go and then just reflect in their journal and think. I'm like, what are you thinking about? Just do something. <laughs> right? Yeah, two journals. One for gratitude, one for CG what? One for following the... I'm like, seriously? Is there too much? Uh, is there such a thing as too much thinking? But you know something? That is, those are the best scientists in the world. Those are the best analysts. They, they can sit down and work their way through a problem long before. As our sanguines are talking, these people are solving problems. That's a genius. Commend your child. There are careers that will pay them great money for them to become analysts and thinkers and philosophers. Yeah. Think tank. There have been people's think tanks. Yeah, I mean, this, this is just, it's a gift. Some of them, some of you are just good at listening. You know those kids who, you, you, people would come to you and they tell you and just like, oh my gosh, he said what? Uh, 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 how did you feel? Oh my gosh. And it's like, who does? I mean, it's like, <laughs> you're just good listeners. And that's a genius, by the way. Did you know that? It's called int- in, in interpersonal skills. The, the introspection is intrapersonal skills, but interpersonal skills are being, being able to analyze other people to discern when something is wrong. We have a child who, if you enter the house with a secret, they will know. I have a child who has a genius. Like, that's... I, I, you know my children, so I can't tell you all about them. But, yeah, you enter... Like, as parents, we couldn't hide any secrets. If we wanted to keep a secret from this child, keep it away from the house. Because if I enter the house looking in any way likely to suggest that I didn't greet her the same way as I did yesterday. She'll be like, what's wrong? Nandi, what, what are you hiding from me? <laughs> like, like, seriously, how do you know? It's just a genius. It's discernment. And all of us are genius at something. So I, I just say that because parents, sometimes just, we get into this competition. You hear someone saying, my child got four A's, 400, and you're like, oh God, what happened to mine? No, there's nothing wrong with your child. That's just one area of grading. That's the only problem with our education system. They only reward one area. 
we really a, a good whole, holistic education system should grade people in their geniuses. So let people win their medals in running and celebrate them for running. Not all of us are good at running. Praise God for you who run. Yeah, Pastor Noel. <laughs> so as Christians, we often, we often think that we'll receive the same reward from Jesus. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The truth is that God will reward our work from him, for him, but will actually be directly proportional to our fruitfulness, to how much we multiplied our life for him. And I know it sounds crazy to say this, but not everybody in your DG will have this reward. Ooh, he didn't just go there. Not, not everybody in your discipleship group will have the same reward. And God isn't asking for the same things from you because he gave you different gifts. So God doesn't have the same marking scheme, but there's some things that are going to be the same because he says fruitfulness is fruitfulness. The question is how you used your genius to achieve fruitfulness. He doesn't expect us all to, use, to achieve it the same way. Some of us are sanguines. We're going to bring people into discipleship by our loud noise. Hey, what's up? And everybody loves you. Some of us are analysts. We're going to pray people into the kingdom of God as we figure out one by one. We're not going to be reaching crowds. But every single one of us, fruitfulness is our expectation. God expects fruitfulness of us. There's one last servant, the one meaner servant. Uh, he returned it and explained he had hidden it safely at home. Notice the, what, the, what, the, what the master called him. He said he called him a wicked servant. And he said, you should have at least put my money on deposit so I get some return from it. Then in verse 24, he said, to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10. Does that sound unfair? He's like, seriously, at least give the one or five. Or at least, by the way, this guy didn't squander his money like the other seven. He at least kept it. It was safe. He returned it. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the reality is, even for you, at, say for instance at work, you always give the best opportunities to the people who've proved they can handle them. It's just the way it is. If you are wise enough to understand that, then you need, you need to know God is even wiser than you. And the consequence for the man was that even what he had was taken away from him. From him. There was no rulership over opportunity over cities, not even a village. Maybe he was expecting to be told, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's one city to rule over. But he, he wasn't even given a village. And here's the thing. I believe there are some of us who will enter into heaven. Okay, they're not here. But they will enter with nothing to show for their entry. You'll be in, but you'll have nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. Just to show you, it's not just my belief, but it actually exists in scripture. If what has been built survives the builder will receive a reward. It talks about a burning that will come to prove each man's works. And then it says, verse 15, if it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though as one, only as one escaping through the flames. In other words, you'll enter heaven and you'll just be smelling of smoke. All your works burnt up. Yes, you made it. Yes, you made it, but you just made it. You're there. And it's a beautiful thing. Praise God, I'm in, I'm in Jesus' presence but have no works, nothing to show to him. And the Bible tells us if we don't use what God has given us stewardship over, we will suffer loss, both of potential reward, but also of the opportunity to serve God more fully in eternity. Why do I say that? Because if you notice the reward, the reward for these servants was not money, it was rulership. Have you noticed that? He doesn't say, oh, come on, you've given me 10 minas, keep them. Oh, here is another 10 minas. He says, no, 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 no. From 10 minas, rule over 10 cities. The result, the reward that God gives is rulership. And I want you to notice that this is what God had initially created human beings for. Because in the garden, he made us to rule over the earth. He said to them in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, rule over all the creation, over the birds and the fish and of the sea, over everything that runs across the earth. I want you to rule over that thing. And it's like with the devil stealing away that authority, God comes and gives the authority back. And he gives us the opportunity to rule the earth again. But just to understand that your rulership over the earth is just a dress rehearsal for greater things. There are far greater things that you will rule over. And that will be your reward in eternity. As human beings, you are created to rule. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.12. I'm giving you a lot of scriptures because I want you to see things that we often don't hear. Just to begin to understand, yeah, there's a much bigger thing that God has for you. It's easy for you to be praying for rent. It's easy for you to be praying for a big house and a big car and thinking that that's what reward is. Those are good things. But there's far greater that you should be fixing your eyes on. 2 Timothy 2.12. 
It says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. What is reign? It's rule. It's rule. You will rule. Come on, ruler. Yeah. You're a principality. You're a ruler. That's what you are created for. To rule. Can you see yourself? Queen, king, then insert name. Can you see it? Huh? Yeah. Royalty. You're created to rule. He says, if we disown him, he will also disown us. So there's two things. You can either rule and reign with him or you'll be disowned. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. Oh, 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 oh come on, somebody. That's mind-blowing. The sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. And then it says his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And all rulers, who are those rulers? Yeah? Yeah, because the ones who are not, worship, are not worshiping, they're not even there. Their eternity took them to a different destination. But it says all rulers who worship and obey him. Revelation chapter 2 verse 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give over nations. Your reward is ruling. Your reward is rulership. Your reward is authority. You are actually created for that. The little things that you're leading on earth are just preparing you for far bigger things. The leadership you're learning on earth is preparing you for far greater rulership and leadership. And Jesus' reward of rulership will be given to his people. But it's on the basis of what they did on earth. And that's the thing that's interesting because not everybody will have the same rulership, the same degree of rulership. Many will be there but without the same level of access. It's an interesting thing because in heaven it won't be a tragedy. The beautiful thing about heaven, heaven is a place of justice and fairness. So if you don't have the same level of access as the person in your DG, you won't even feel bad for them because you'll actually understand it was just. Because everything will be clear. The cloud will tell you what they did and the cloud will tell you what you did. And to be very clear for you, honestly, the reason they have that access. Have you ever gone to a place and then you found your, your friend that you thought you knew talking to somebody you didn't think they knew? Yeah. <laughs> huh? You walk in and you thought you were boys. Huh? Geneva and I, we always hang out. Then you find Geneva talking to Sijui, President King of where? You're like, huh? How? How did this member of my DG have such access? Like, who are they? Like, who are you? You know how they say it in the Marvel movies? Like, who are you? When you see the superpower, you're like, who are you? Like, what, 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 what access is this? Who is this you know? Like, who are you? That we won't all have the same level of access. You go to a wedding and you find there's some people who sit near the bride. And they celebrate. They, they, they can even take selfies from their table. Shua. And you can just see the bridal couple right here. Shua. You're in the wedding. <laughs> you're also there, by the way. It's just that for you, you're seeing her on the screen, isn't it? It's like you're both in the wedding because there are many people who didn't make the wedding. So at least you're in the wedding. But there's some people who have access that you don't have access. And I think it's very interesting because it makes some Christians very uncomfortable to talk about these rewards. But it's actually true. In, it's, it's, it's interesting because in Revelation chapter 24, it talks about the elders casting down their crowns. Revelation 4.12. It talks about 24 elders casting down their crowns. What are crowns? Crowns are symbols of rulership. Yeah? They're symbols of rulership. Let me tell you something about heaven. The thing that will satisfy you most in heaven is worship. The thing that will make you, like, you live, we were, man was created to worship God. You will be in your element. You'll be in the place where it is right. This is what I was made for. Have you ever felt this is what I've made, I was made for? Your soul is at home. Like when we were growing up, I mean, when our kids were growing up, I remember just taking them to um, a really, really nice hotel. And I don't know how kids, even when they're young, they know. One of my kids walked in and said, wow, this is nice. Like, like something in her soul just told her, where we've come from home is not nice. This is nice. 
This is nice. Then I remember we at one point we had to move to a different neighborhood and we were taking them to a really nice school, but now we were living in a, in a neighborhood where the schools were not as nice. And I remember the same child walked into that school, looked around and said, Mommy, this school is fake. Like, nobody ever told this child that this is not the same level. But something in her just felt this is not the beauty I was created for. There's something lacking in this place that was in the other place. This place is fake. Let me tell you something. There's something in you that was created to worship God. When you enter into his presence, you will just want to worship. You will want to just sing songs to him. There will be, you, there will be a tireless energy in you just to worship God. And the thing about worshiping is, the thing about worshiping that makes it so amazing is when you bring gifts to the one you worship. And these 24 elders, they have crowns. And they're casting their crowns. They're worshiping God with, the, with all the authority he's given them, with all the responsibility. They can say, Master, I bring you something of what you've given me. And the thing for me I realize is, all of us will have crowns. But not, ev not everybody. <laughs> I'm seeing all of us in the room. But not everybody in heaven will have a crown. Because not everybody will have rulership. Yeah? There are those who will enter smelling of smoke. With nothing to give the one they love somebody told us a vision. I don't remember who it was, Carol, who was telling us about a dream they had and how when Jesus receives a person, how he crowns you with jewels and crowns. You remember that? Somebody still, I think it was Pastor Jay. Like you're given jewels and you're given crowns and it's spectacular and you're looking and you're thinking, my God. I mean, it's like we never think that that's how God receives us. And this person was telling us how in that vision they realized they were not getting the same crown. The party was not the same. And they were asking God, what, did, what have I not done right? What is it that I didn't know? Well, the beauty of this message today is today you know that what we do on earth determines our eternal compensation. That's why that ball is there. That's why the ball is there. That God is giving us an opportunity to exercise rulership on his behalf. And that that rulership prepares us for eternal rulership. And to the ones who show themselves able to rule, they will receive greater responsibilities. The ones who don't will be there. And they will worship. And I bless God. By the way, I, don't, I never want to diminish going to heaven. Just entering heaven smelling of smoke is a good thing. But you have a chance for so much more. Yeah, you have an opportunity for so much more. And you know it. It's like the marking scheme has already been given long before the exam. When the judgment seat of Christ comes, you'll already know. By the way, God is such a good teacher. You know those teachers who tell you, here's what I'm setting in the exam. Day one of class. He's already told you what it's going to take for you to have rulership. He says, just be faithful and multiply. Make disciples of the nations. And my prayer is that you will never again think that faithfulness to God just means not sinning and coming to church on time. True faithfulness is about multiplying what God has given you. It's about multiplying your life. Multiplying your impact. Using what God has given you to bless people around you. And the eternal reward I get for that multiplication is I get to rule. By the way, this message shouldn't make you feel depressed. It should actually make you happy. Because what it should tell you is everything you do on earth counts. Everything we are doing right now counts. In the next talk, I'm going to give you the marking scheme according to the scripture. It's such an easy one. By the way, already you're doing those things. But when you know you're doing them, you know there's some things you're just doing that you're doing. But once you know what, how they count, my suspicion is you're going to do them completely different going forward. Because you understand, I'm in the ball. <laughs> I'm right, on, right now, my life is on the ball. It's a small thing I'm living for. Right now, my daddy, he's on that rope. He's living, he's in that space with his maker. He's in that space where he's beginning to understand, to see the fruit of his life. And I'm so grateful because I know he lived a fruitful life. That's where he is. And my prayer is for all of us. Yeah, we're going to experience that. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to manage a valuable asset for your master. Every one of us gets that mission. Thank you, George. Thank you, Pastor George. I love Pastor George. <laughs> your mission is to manage a valuable asset. That asset is your life. The sum of your talents, your strengths, your interests, and your possession. Your mission is to manage that life in such a way that you greatly increase your master's kingdom on earth. 
Your master has not returned, but could do so any time, any day. And the most important question you should be answering every day is, how can I be a good steward today of everything my master has placed into my care? And I want you to realize that every day of your life, whether conscious or not, you are answering that question. Every day of your life, you're making the decisions that will assure you of your eternal compensation. The decisions you're making today are determining your eternal rewards. Our eternal destination is a consequence of what we believe. Praise God for that. But our eternal compensation is a consequence for how we behave on earth. Let me just say this. Somebody might even be saying, Pastor, you're teaching legalism. I mean, we're saved by grace. Yes, I understand that, guys. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, I think it's verse 16, it tells us that faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God because, oh yeah, there it is, because anyone who comes to Him must believe He exists and, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 it's there. What else do you need? It's actually written. Yes, you believe. That belief is what assures you of your eternal destination. Yeah, you must believe. Let me just say, if you're in this room and you've not yet accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not assured of your eternal destination. That is the first action you must take. You must believe in Him. You must accept Him as the Lord of your life. That assures you. That's the first part of faith. But the second part is what we're talking about. You must believe He exists and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Our God is a rewarder. Our God is a rewarder. I pray that everybody in Mavuno, nobody in this church will miss out on their eternal destination. Uh -uh, I have to see you in heaven. I have to see you in heaven. Me, I'm going. Not because I'm such a holy person, but because God accepted this sinner. Uh -uh. Anita, we are many. Tukowengi in this church. Yeah, he accepted even me. I, was, I know. I was there. Even me, I have a track record. I'm one of those ones least qualified. God accepts us. Bless the Lord. And we are not accepted because of anything we did. We are accepted because we believed. Praise God for that. I pray none of you will miss out on heaven. But here's the thing I also want to pray. I want to pray that all of you will be in the front row casting down your crowns. The many crowns. Because you knew what God expected of you and you did it. You didn't get caught up in a divided faith following the things of this world. Forgetting that there's a major thing that every decision we're making every day is counting towards our eternal compensation. And my prayer is that we'll all be there, including myself. I pray that for myself. One day I read, I heard of somebody who had a vision and they saw heaven and they were seeing levels in heaven. By the way, this, I was so shocked by that vision. I remember telling my wife, I, I need to go back to the Bible. Are there levels in heaven? Until Paul talks about the, the, third, the third heaven. So this person said, there are levels in heaven. And says, when I entered heaven in my vision, the first level, I saw many famous pastors. By the way, the first level was the farthest one from Jesus. And I'm like, ah? Famous big pastors who had big ministries. And he says, these people, when I ask God, why are they here? I thought these ones are the ones who should be next to Abraham. Next to Jesus. And God, or the angel told the person in the vision, those ones, reward, they received their reward on earth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they served me and they brought people to Christ. But they received, they followed other things. They had a divided faith. So yes, they got into the place, but all the rewards they got were on earth because they valued the things of the world. And I say, Lord, forgive. I never want to think because I'm a pastor that I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing for you, that I'm living the life I should be living. Never assume your position is what will assure you of your compensation. Yes, they made it into heaven, but my goodness, this lady said in her vision, she, by the way, when I had it, my wife can tell you, I was so shocked by that thing. I didn't even sleep well that night. I was like, you can be a pastor with a big ministry that has brought thousands to Christ and you're in the uh, level, you know the stadium, those guys in the nosebleed section. Like it's so cold up there, you're just watching two players on the field. I'm like, no, 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 God, that's not what I want for myself. I want to be that disciple Jesus loved. I want to be close to him. I want to be at the table. I want to hear his voice. I know everybody will be hearing his voice, but I want, to, I want everything that God has for me. I don't want to miss out on things that God has. There are treasures that God has for me, hidden treasures. I want every single one of them. I don't want to miss out if it was intended for me. And so I want to, I'm going to talk about the, the, what we do to get those rewards. 
because there's some very clear scriptural clues. But for now, I just want to pray very quickly before we have our tea for somebody here. I really want to pray. Somebody here who wants to be a 10 mina servant, a thousand percent Christian. And I suspect, by the way, every one of you is in that level. This, this, one, this one is not for a few. This one is for everybody. But before I pray for everybody, I want to pray for somebody who's not given their life to Jesus. You're not assured of your eternal destination. Maybe you even had it, but you walked away. You're one of those who backslid. We talked about you. But today you finally understood, my goodness, this is not a game. It's not a joke. It's serious. This is ultimate reality. The world is a matrix that blinds our eyes to ultimate reality. And today, for the first time, you've understood, my goodness, this is why I must give my life to Jesus. I want to pray for you if this is you. I just want to ask you to raise your hand, put it down again. Right here in this loving family, would love to pray for you as you give your life to Jesus. Anybody who's saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus today. Thank you, my brother. I see you. To God be the glory for you. Amen. Amen. I see another brother in the middle here. Praise God. Wow. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. Anybody else? I told you there's a party in heaven. I need to remind us today there's a party in heaven because of men and women who give their lives to Jesus. Anybody else? Come on, just put up your hand. I see you as well, my brother. Wow. To God be the glory. Woo! Our cheering is nothing compared to what's happening in heaven right now. I tell you. <laughs> Anybody else? Join the three brothers who put up their hands and just say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be one of those ones who is assured. I walk out of this place assured of my destiny, assured of my purpose, assured of my destination. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. This is not, nobody's manipulating you. This is your life. This is, you came here to receive life and to receive eternity. This is what God wants for you. And he wants you to also find your purpose while you're here on earth. Anybody else? Just put up your hand. I just, I don't know why I sense in my heart that there are people who are struggling. You came here and this is why you came. And maybe you're feeling, no, I'm shy. Listen, even the ones who put up their hand are shy. But they've understood this is not about your neighbor. This is about yourself. Uh, your neighbor may be looking comfortable, but the reason they're comfortable is because they know where they're going. <laughs> so don't, don't be confused by them. Don't, get, don't mess around with them. You put up your hand for yourself. Anybody else who's saying, Pastor, pray for me. I really want this. Uh, this is something that I know God brought me here. You heard about somebody who talked about the fact that in November, they walked into this church, and today they know their eternal destination. You too can join those people. Come on, somebody just raise up your hand. I know you're here. Bless the Lord for you, my brother. Wow. Today is a day of men, huh? I see men in this house giving their lives to Jesus. Praise God. I see another one at the back there. Praise God for you. Wow. The Holy Spirit is in this house. I sense it. God has decided today men are getting saved. To God be the glory. Wow, wow, wow. By the way, huh, my, heart, my heart goes out somebody struggling right now and I need you to say to the devil get thee behind me Satan there's someone right now who's struggling you know you need to make this decision but there's so many torments things that are keeping you back right now you actually need to say this is something that is out to destroy you and to destroy your background uh, your, your, your bloodline and I want to just give you an encouragement right now to just whisper and say get thee behind me Satan that hand that's refusing to go up I want you to just actually say Jesus help me and then raise that hand because this is your eternal destiny at sake. I just sense there's someone struggling. I don't know why. In my spirit, I'm still feeling a struggle. I'm still feeling that there's someone here who's not yet. There's, a, there's, there's actually a conflict. Remember I told you in the spirit, there's a, there's a conflict going on for your soul. Anybody else? I've seen that brother there. Praise God for him. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. I, 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 I plead with you. Now I'm even pleading. Because I know that the Lord brought you here. I just sense in my spirit there's someone the Lord brought who needs to make that decision. Is there anybody else? Final call. All right. I'm going to just pray for those whose hands are up. Let me just ask you if you raised your hand to just stand where you are. I'm not going to call you up to the front because of space. Just stand up where you are. Let's appreciate them as they stand. All these men who are standing. And it's, not, it's still not too late. You can join them even if you didn't put up your hand. Just stand, stand, stand. Wow, 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 wow. Amen, amen, amen. Can somebody just reach out to them as they're standing and tell them, welcome to the family. Yeah, so good to have you. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. We're so grateful for you. To God be the glory. As you remain standing, I'm going to just lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you for those who are standing, just put out your hands. Put out your hands in front of yourself. This is a gesture, the universal gesture of surrender. And you're just surrendering to God as you, as you stand right now. And I want you to say this prayer with me and those who are next to you will help you say it because they've also said it and it's their profession. It's already what they believe. Dear Jesus, 
I come today to you as my creator and now my father. Forgive my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to follow you. From this day forward, I am your child. I will follow you all my life as you give me strength. Now I want you to put your hand up to the heavens like this. Just put point to the heavens. Point with one finger to the heavens and just say, Devil, from this day forward, I cast you out of my life. You and I have nothing in common. I belong to Jesus. I renounce you and all your works. I am assured of my eternal destination. I bless the Lord because you and I are no longer friends. And so depart from me and everything that belongs to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on, let's give a big hand to our brothers. Thank you so much.